Good morning, Lighthouse Community Church, Lifeline Ministries, and anyone else tuning in with us this morning. We're so happy to have you join us. My name is Matt. I'm one of our service directors here, and I just wanted to share a word of encouragement this morning with you guys from Psalm chapter 150. And it goes like this. Hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his abundant greatness. Praise him with trumpet blast. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with flute and strings. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for who you are, Lord, that you are a holy and a just God, and that you are good above all else and in every sense of the word, God. We love you because you have given us a hope that never fails, Lord, a hope that is eternal and that goes beyond just this current life that we're in now. We love you because we're made in your image, God, and because we are fearfully and wonderfully made by you. We thank you for that. And as we step into worship right now, God, we ask for your forgiveness, Lord. We ask for forgiveness for those moments in our lives when we fail to honor you with our life, when we fail to love others, God, when we fail to love you, God. Uh, we're sorry, and we, uh, we ask that you help us to uh, live um, as an ambassador of you, God, um, that we could love you first, Lord, and out of that love that you pour into us, God, we can pour out into others, Lord, and, and be your salt and, and be the light of this earth as you call us to be. And right now, I just want to ask for uh, that, that you would help us remove any distractions, any excuses we might have on our mind that uh, might be pulling us away from wanting to worship you, God. I pray that um, yeah, you would turn that into something, uh, turn that into a desire for us to worship you now because of who you are, because you deserve all honor, all glory, and all praise from us, God. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Please join us in worship. Oh, 
you done it before? Won't you do it again? Lost and revival, Lost and in now. A move of your spirit, heaven break out. Come now in power, cover this land like you done it before. Would you do it again? Thanks for joining our Sunday service. Uh, always glad to have you. So let's just get right into it. Um, as one of the pastors at LCC, one of my main roles is to take care of the youth ministry. So naturally, what that looks like is that I essentially become a personal Uber driver for a lot of the kids at church. I'm just driving kids around a lot, and I don't mind it. I like it. I like the conversations we have. But there's this one time, I was driving a group of boys, and one of the boys, he started talking about one of the girls at our youth group, and he was just saying, Yo, this girl, her Instagram is so fresh, it's so fire, it's so lit, which translated to normal English means this young female has good photos of herself on this photo sharing app. And I'm just trying to keep, I'm keeping the conversation going and I'm, I'm jokingly asking him, hey, what about my Instagram? Is it fresh or fire or lit? And he just straight up said, no. Um, super blunt, but I'm okay with that because I, ex- I was completely expecting that when I asked the question. But as I kind of just laughed and I asked why, his answer completely caught me off guard. Because without any hesitation whatsoever, he just said, because your teeth are messed up. And I was waiting for like a, just kidding, or I got you, like a laugh, no, nothing. It was just a straight faced answer. He wasn't teasing. He wasn't trying to be funny. This was just purely facts. To him, the the sun is hot. The mountains are big. Water is wet. Tim's teeth are messed up. And it's like, ouch. Okay, ouch. So let's just pause here for a second. That hurt. Okay, that hurt me more than it should have. Uh, I kind of just want to talk. I kind of want to just keep talking like this. And it was a little bit embarrassing in front of the other boys I was driving. So help me out, okay? Put yourself in my shoes in that moment. What should I have done next? And that's our whole question today, okay? How should Tim take revenge on this youth kid? No, I'm kidding. The question is, how do we handle conflict? How do we handle conflict? Now, we all know Uh, that conflict is a huge part of life. We all have people that we disagree with and we have people who hurt us. And these conflicts, right, they range from just like annoyed glances between strangers to full-on wars between countries. But how we handle those disagreements, those hurts, those conflicts, it makes a ton of difference. And our Bible passage today will teach us the best way and the Christian way to handle conflict. And perhaps it's also the hardest way, but also the most rewarding way. So our big idea today is that in conflict, we need to be willing to lose in order to win. We need to be willing to lose in order to win. Let's go back to my story for a second. My first instinct, other than going home and looking up a quote, Uh, on familybraces.ca was to get back at him, right? To say, you're not so great yourself. And I'll like list all the things that are wrong with him and just tear him apart. And sure, it's mean, but I feel like for most of us, it's, it's all right. That's defending yourself. It's fair, right? He hurt you, you hurt him back. That's just the way life should be. And in a way, that's right. But Jesus speaks to this in a profound way, right? So read with me from Matthew 5, 38 to 42. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, 
and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And that's where we get our first point from. To handle conflict, we need to be willing to lose. Because in our Bible passage, every example that Jesus gives us is about losing on purpose, right? So it's not this passively submitting to the hurt or, or seeing evil and saying, oh man, that's, there's nothing I can do about that, so I'm just going to lay down and take it. No, it's actually the intentional, it's the intentional taking control of yourself in any situation so that you're no longer just a victim anymore. And in that control, you're making the conscious decision to lose. See, you're, you're, you're choosing to take the role of a servant. You're choosing humility. You're choosing not to repay, with, repay evil with evil, which is my natural reaction, but rather you're choosing to answer evil with love. And that's like an impossibly hard lesson. I mean, if, if Jesus was just some preacher sitting by a mountain, giving sermons like this, and telling me to repay evil with love, I don't think I could do it. But Jesus doesn't just teach us with his words. Jesus teaches us with his life. When Jesus was arrested, he was beaten and tortured, and he didn't resist. And, and just think about it. Jesus is God, right? He can, he can legit Thanos snap his fingers and make all of his enemies disappear, and yet he, what he did instead was turn the other cheek. When he tells us to hand over our coat, he let his enemies strip him completely and, and cast lots for his clothes so that he was naked on the cross. When he says, walk an extra mile for your enemies, he let the soldiers make him carry his cross, his heavy, heavy cross, up a hill while he was already half beaten to death. And finally, when Jesus says, do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you, from the one in need. He saw us deeply lost and deeply stuck in the debt of our sins and brokenness, and then he gave his life for us so that we can have it all. So Jesus practiced what he preached and gave us an example of what it looks like to repay evil with love and how much better that solution is for everyone, when Jesus literally saves all of humanity by doing this. Now, let's, let's be transparent for a second, okay? If you're like me, you would hear this lesson of intentionally losing, and you would naturally just think of a million scenarios where this seems like the dumbest thing ever. So, for example, imagine someone broke into my house in the middle of the night, and they threatened to kill Christine. Would I ever say, wait, 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 no, no, stop! Not yet. I also have a baby and a dog in the other room for you. No, of course not. That makes no sense. That's, that's stupid. And I think the point is that it's not always time to lose. The Bible itself tells us to resist certain kinds of evil and not to give people what they want. So we know it's not always time to make these bold sacrifices. But I think rather Jesus' point is that we need to consider making these sacrifices. We need to consider losing on purpose so that even when we choose not to lose, we are still taking the position of humility and love. You've, you've probably heard of a, a rising internet trend, a meme, and it's a, a stereotype of a person who would never, ever consider losing. And that stereotype is Karen. Okay, Karen. Now, I know a lot of great Karens in my life, but the, the stereotype internet version of Karen is this soccer mom who would never go down without a fight. She will fight and fight and fight for what is hers. She will complain and ask to talk to your manager. She will bring hell to whoever wronged her and whoever is on her bad side. She seems terrible to be around. And the thing is, even though... She often gets what she wants. She's miserable, right? We don't look at Karen's and think, gee, I, I want her life. Now, I think the question in my head is, is she super aggressive because she's miserable or is she miserable because she's always demanding for her rights? And I think that the answer is both, 
right? It kind of builds on top of each other over and over and over again until you have a Karen. And though Karen always seems to win in the moment, I think they're losing in the long run. So don't be a Karen unless your name is actually Karen. And I'm so sorry about that whole spiel. Um, but for us, in conflict, consider the benefits of losing. Right? The freedom that comes with not trying to like golem grasp onto what is yours, but rather giving. Because we know that God has given us so much more. See, because we are eternally secure, we can afford to lose out in this life. And it's, it's only through considering losing and taking the role of a humble servant that we can do the kind of work that God has put us on earth to do. It might sound like you're getting the short end of the stick, but actually people who can lose like this, they become the greatest winners in life. And they're the happiest in the end. And that actually leads me to our second point. We need to consider losing so that we can win. There was a neuroscientist named uh, Yak Pangsep who was curious about the different motivators in the human mind and how that affects what we do. And so to gain insight on this, he thoroughly studied the patterns of play between rats. Weird, I know. Um, but rats, they, they play by uh, rough and tumble wrestling. Right? They wrestle and they pin each other down. So in an experiment, Pangsep had a strong and a big rat wrestle and play with a small and weak rat. And what he found was that if the bigger rat didn't let the smaller rat win at least 30% of the time, the smaller rat would eventually stop playing with them and leave. So oftentimes, the bigger rat would actually choose to lose, even though every single time he could win. And that's, that's, that's crazy to me. That makes no sense to me. Because even in these small, simplistic animals, they understand that they have to choose to lose every now and then so that they can win something even greater. And in this case, the bigger rat, what he wins is he wins a friend. He wins a playing mate. Now, there is a kind of reward that can only be obtained through losing. And that's what Jesus is talking about, right? Let's read the next few verses of our main passage. It is from Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are, you not, are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Whoa, okay, whoa. Loving your enemies? Like, what? It's, there, what? What? There, there's a lot that's happening in this passage, but if you just stare at it for like a really long time, you might notice that the ideas of this passage they actually form a sandwich, right? Where the outer layers of the sandwich is about our Father in heaven. And as you go to the next level inside, it contrasts the generosity of God versus the greed of people. And then right smack in the middle of the sandwich is this idea of a reward. Right? A reward, something that you're chasing after. And sandwiches like these, or in technical terms, chiastic structures, um, they're all over the Bible and they help us understand the core meaning of a Bible passage. And in our case, we know that this passage is telling us that we are to chase after a reward, after a gain. We're trying to win something here. We're not, we're not loving our enemies for the sake of loving our enemies. No, we're loving our enemies because that's the best way to live our lives. We're trying to make earth like heaven. And so let's see how Jesus suggests we do that. How do we win? Starting with the outer layers of our sandwich. So Jesus, he, he, he brings up this idea twice, this theme of uh, being children to our Father in heaven. Or 
being perfect, which is also commonly translated as complete and mature, like our Father in heaven, right? What's up with that? Like, what, what does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with winning? What does that have to do with loving your enemies? Well, it's kind of like this. Here is a picture of me and Christine. Take it in, analyze our faces, take note of my teeth. Okay, cool. And here's a picture of our little boy. Who does he look more like? To me, it, it kind of looks like he, he has Christine's eyes and nose, and he has my chins and hairline. But whatever it is, as our child, he looks like us, okay? He looks like us. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. Since we are children of God and people made in his image, we are to look like God. That is how we become complete and perfect and mature. That's what humans are supposed to look like. And then naturally, what's, what's the next question that you ask Jesus? Well, you'll ask Jesus, what does God look like, right? How, do, how can we know what he looks like? And that's when we go to the next layer of the sandwich. Jesus answers this in a way I've never even thought about before. Jesus says, if you want to know what God looks like, look outside your window. Okay, look at the sky, look at the weather. God is in control of all of that. That's his. And so what he does with that actually teaches us what he is like. And then Jesus goes on and he talks about God's son, like his son in the sky. And how God makes it shine on the wicked and the good. And he talks about the rain and how he makes rain fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so what does that tell us about God? What does God look like? God looks like love, right? This intense, immense, impartial, unconditional love towards everyone, okay? Towards everyone. That's who he is. He loves everyone. The people we call our enemies, he loves them. The people who are just saying really mean stuff about your teeth, God loves them. Me and you, who are sinful and broken and have all these dark secrets that only God knows about, he loves you. And so if we want to look like God, then we live and act like God in loving everyone, even our enemies. And that's how we win. Now, now in the parallel part of the sandwich, on the other side, Jesus, sh Jesus shows the losing strategy, okay? Which is to only love those who love us. Now, I'm sure even if you can imagine the most evil and vile person in history, okay? Like, let's say, let's say Hitler, for example. They probably are still loving to their family, right? They're probably still nice to their friends. He probably like pets dogs and feeds his, I don't know, pets. So do we give him a prize for that? No, no way, right? Jesus is making the point. Um, when, when Jesus talks about pagans who do that, he's making the point that even people who don't have the Bible, people who don't know God, even they do that. But for us, who do know God and have been saved by the work of Jesus and living as like citizens of the kingdom of heaven, it makes absolutely, absolutely no sense for us to hate anyone who is loved by God, to make an enemy out of anyone who is loved by God. And so we do as God does and we love. Now, love, okay, what, what, what in the world is love? So I love um, burgers, and I love uh, my baby boy, and I love um, Hillsong United. I don't know what I do, but let's just say that's an example. Now, what, which love is it? How do we love our neighbors? Well, I say it's something that's beyond all of those kinds of loves, right? This love that Jesus is talking about is more than all of that. It's choosing to shift your attitude and your mindset to care for a person, to want the best for them, to genuinely try to bless them because you know they are made in God's image and that they are loved by Him. 
So you do this even when you don't feel like it, and that's still love. And what, at, what that attitude always, always leads to is action, right? Love always has to manifest itself through action. As we, as we choose this way of loving, even like the worst and the most annoying people, we are choosing to be like God and choosing to bring about a kingdom that is forever good and we're choosing to follow the best strategy to win at life. Now, how can we practically apply uh, this to our everyday lives? Well, I think for us, especially in our day, it's so easy and natural to just love those who are like us. Right? To, to try to be around those who have similar interests and hobbies as us and, and come together and just like create these groups and these crews and these like families. Um, and that's, that's great, okay? That's a good thing. That's beautiful. But where that beauty and where that good is corrupted is when we fall into this weird tribal identity mentality where we start to consider those who are outside our little family, outside our little circle, as enemies, okay? As people who don't deserve our time, our effort, and our love. So perhaps something we can do this week is choose to take a step outside of that tribal boundary and figure out how can we love people who are different than us. And remember that love always manifests itself into action, right? So, so maybe you can arrange a walk with someone you've never talked to. Or, or like let's say you have a gift, like you're a baker. You can bake them something. Buy a bubble tea and share it with someone outside of your group. Or, or get to understand someone you find that's completely annoying and irritating by taking the time to listen to their story. Because as we commit ourselves to loving people, Outside of our circles, we're becoming more like God. We're training ourselves to one day even love those who are seemingly impossible to love. And I'm sure as I, I talk about this, you, you might have like a person or two in your head. So, so hold on to that and keep thinking about them. Okay, Ask yourself, what can I do for this person this week to love them? Let's summarize everything I said. Um, with a recap. How do we handle conflict? Our first point is that we consider losing. There's a freedom that comes from not needing to win all the time. And only if you are willing to lose can we make the impact that God put us on earth for. But we don't lose for no reason. We're not just mindless martyrs, okay? Our second point is that we consider losing so that we can win. We love everyone, even our enemies, because God loves everyone. And that is our best strategy at winning. That's our, the best way at getting the rewards. So, so put this into practice this week by acting out our love to people outside of our normal social circles. This is how we win. Now, now let's, let's end with a quick reflection, okay? Win what? What am I talking about when I say win? What's the reward? What are we chasing after? What's the gain? Well, we often say that the rewards of eternity are things like winning souls and the praise of God. But that, that's quite hard to imagine since it's, just, it's quite out there and abstract, right? So, so take it down a level with me for a second. Imagine with me, okay? Imagine a world where, where you would normally have an enemy Whoever that may be, someone that is actually maybe an enemy now to you, you now have a friend. A society where um, every, instead of everyone being in competition and against one another, you now have unity and cooperation because of love and compassion. And then as a result of that, where you would normally have people living in fear and mistrust and insecurity, you now have everyone living in the confidence of how much they are loved and cared for, not only by each other, but by God. And now here's the craziest part, okay? Imagine all of that. That is just a glimpse of what heaven is like. And imagine all of that as just a tiny sample of the goal and of the reward that we are chasing after. And perhaps with that in mind, 
we can face the conflicts of our everyday willing to lose so that we can win. As we conclude our time together today, let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us today.